So my name is Sarah McKinnon and I'm an assistant professor in communication arts and rhetoric, politics and culture. And it is my honor to be introducing our guest speaker for today, Professor Adela Licona. Uh, professor Licona is an associate professor of English and the interim director of the Institute for LGBT Studies at the University of Arizona. These positions seem to locate Professor Licona in particular disciplines, but when you examine the vastness and the diverseness of her projects, it becomes evident that she embodies mestizaje in her approach to scholarly and activist work. Drawing on rhetoric, performance studies, queer, feminist, sexuality studies, and gender studies, and putting these fields in conversation with geography, environmental studies, and Chicanao and Latino studies, Professor Licona's research is refreshingly border crossing and in so being resistant to location and siloing. This resistance to placement is reflected in the themes of her writing and creations. Specifically, she examines the ways groups on the margins, such as feminist and queer of color, uh, gender nonconforming youth, immigrant communities, um, and many other communities, use various innovative and resistant modes of expression to articulate their ways of knowing and experience in a world that often doesn't hear or see them. Professor Licona shows how these creations enable connection and coalition, possibility and potentiality, rupture and resistance. In effect, Professor Licona examines how people on the margins make worlds with the intent to change worlds. This world and change making is evident in her 2012 book with SUNY Press entitled Zines in the Third Space, Radical Cooperation and Borderland Rhetoric. In it, Professor Licona examines feminist and queer of color zinesters' use of borderland rhetoric to disrupt and create new cultural, economic, political, and sexual configurations. This happens primarily through the coalitional possibilities that these zinesters work to cultivate, allowing readers whose lives are also constituted by borderland experiences to find connection, new language, and new meaning, and possibilities in a world that often pushes them further to the periphery. Her work has also examined how Latino immigrants, especially those in the U.S. heartland, both feel compelled and welcomed in an experience of Latinidad and at the same time erased. In essays published in Antipode, Noises, the Annals of the Association of American Geographers, uh, Professor Licona ex illuminates the both-neither negotiation for Latino communities in the United States. Her analyses in these projects offer more nuanced attention to the doubleness and the neitherness as we think about and theorize how identity is experienced and articulated. In the work that she'll share with us today, she'll introduce us to the centrality of visual logics of rhetoric making and the compelling nature of the non-image in contemporary discussions of US immigration, national security, and terrorism. As we'll learn, the non-image is something so horrendous that it need not be seen to have rhetorical force in a public's consciousness. Her theorizing of the non-image is so impactful and robust because Professor Lacona herself is a photographer and a cinematographer, using filmic and moving images to explore uh, constraints and possibilities around world making. I encourage you to visit the website mividalandscapes.blogspot.com to see some of her amazing creations. And I think we're going to hear about some of these tomorrow in her talk. She also uses her research skills and artistic abilities toward activists and policy making change. Um, the examples are really too many to address here, but let me cue us into one that we'll learn more about during the Thursday roundtable session. Professor Licona was a part of a collaborative project that documented the experiences of gender nonconforming youth of color in schools. In addition, in addition to public, uh, publishing for academic audiences, the team also developed infographics to address the ways gender nonconforming youth of color are channeled into prison to school pipelines. These infographics were so influential that they were picked up by numerous international and media outlets, including MTV, which based a documentary on the research. Their reports have been read by thousands and are now informing policy making in states around the country about the experiences of trans youth. 
I am so happy that Professor Licona is here with us at UW-Madison. Over the course of the next few days, we're going to learn so much about how to do creative, collaborative work that has practical impact, that builds connections, and that sets the conditions for new possibilities and world-making. Please join me in welcoming Professor Licona. trying to think of words to say um, to thank Sarah for that introduction. It was incredibly generous, and I know it took some time and thought, and I appreciate that. Um, I also want to thank uh, Patrick Barrett and Matt Ryder, Ben Marquez Carma Chavez, and Peter Ramon for the invitation and for the arrangements for this visit. I'm, I'm uh, grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful, too, to everyone and anyone who um, helped prepare the room this evening for us, um, those who may not be present with us but whose labor makes it uh, possible for us to gather here together. Um, I'm thrilled with this opportunity. Um, I, I, I see it as an opportunity to think out loud, and I always imagined that that's what a university was the opportunity to think out loud, to take risks with one's thinking, and to share that, those risks and um, to make meaning of them. And so this is um, such a great invitation. I'm really happy to have uh, accepted it, to have, have received it and accepted it. I was hesitant for one moment, only because I didn't know what was going on on your campus with regards to tenure, and I didn't know how to stand in solidarity with faculty around that issue. Um, so I, I hesitated, and that was the, the, um, really the source of my hesitation. Otherwise, it's been a real uh, pleasure to, to prepare for being here with you. And tonight's talk is a little more formal than tomorrow's. It's longer, too, so take a deep breath, get comfy. Um, it, uh, it's, it's work that is a little bit more advanced, but still, uh, it, I come to you with questions. So let me, let me begin. And I have to see which of my glasses work best. And maybe it's, maybe it's none. Let me see. <laughs> Stay with me. All right, in a July 2010 Washington Post article, journalist Dana Milbank wrote of the, quote, tall tales emerging from Arizona. Milbank was referring to then-Governor Jan Brewer's 2010 claim that Arizona's, quote, law enforcement agencies have found bodies in the desert either buried or just lying out there that have been beheaded. The implication of such a claim was that migrants crossing into the U.S. through Mexico were beheading people in the Arizona desert. Brewer had made a similar claim just days before in a Fox News television interview with Greta Van Susteren. In that interview, Brewer stated that Arizona simply could not afford all, quote, all of this illegal immigration and everything that comes with it, everything from the crime and to the drugs and to the kidnappings and the extortion and the beheadings. It took Brewer three months to answer calls to address the falsity of her claims and intimations that immigrants were beheading people in the Arizona desert. In the, in the meantime, Brewer's illusory claims function similarly to an already established rhetorical trope with productive force um, and with particular implications, I argue, for practices of looking. The rhetorical force and function of her claim was to maintain an association of immigrant with criminal while also shifting and sharpening the public focus for an imagined or imaged immigrant as alien and then immigrant as illegal and on to immigrant as beheading terrorist capable of and culpable for undermining national and state security. Non-images um, or those invisible pictures we do not um, need to see but need only imagine become monstrous and terrorizing images that circulate and are substitutable through what I term a regime of distortion. When she finally did address her fictive claim that migrants were beheading people in Arizona, Brewer stated that if she did say it, it was an error. She worked to explain her error as connected to her fear that, quote, Arizona and her, um, excuse me, connected to her fear for Arizona and her expressed concern that the violence of Mexican drug cartels would spill over from Mexico into U.S. territory. This affective and effective distortion 
further refined the focus from immigrant as beheading terrorists to an even more locally relevant spectacle of immigrant as invading narco-trafficking drug lord. This newly manufactured and disciplining distortion shifted the pub public focus yet again so that immigrants were now given to be seen as suspected members of Mexican drug cartels and as invading narco-traffickers. The rhetorical function of this particular shift was to reference the possibility come likelihood of a territorial and terrorizing invasion into the U.S. Um, and thereby to argue for the need for ever greater border militarization, control, and securitization. Through Brewer's rhetorical claims, value and vulnerability get redistributed, um, and whiteness gets recentered, and a distinction is made between bodies that matter and those that don't. It is in a regime of distortion that non-images are produced and are rhetorically productive. D the distorting power of those precarious rhetorics reveal a hegemonic project of enduring terrorist and terrorizing imaginaries, related ways of seeing, that assign differential devaluations and vulnerabilities to particular bodies, including bodies of knowledge, bodies of land, um, or territory. In the regime of distortion, Brewer's rhetorical claim of immigrant as beheading terrorists is an updated devaluation and distortion related to, but different than the long-standing trope of immigrant as alien. It, it functions as a non-image, which I define as a visual and affective rhetorical claim without the need for an actual referent. In this instance, the given to be seen of Brewer's distorting disinformation was an immigrant as beheading terrorist that through her repeated claims became an intelligible, if again, fictive subject. Such disinformation has a disciplining function for practices of looking, such that the given to be seen is a conjured image, a non-image to be imagined and believed to be seen as always only a threat. So this afternoon, I want to focus on the rhetorical claims made by Jan Brewer and to the past and proposed legislation that such claims engendered to illustrate how a regime of distortion is both produced by and produces precarious rhetorics. Arizona's regime of distortion emerged in what Mary Bloodsworth Lugo and Carmen Lugo Lugo aptly refer to as, quote, the 9-11 project, which implies the post-9-11 social reconfigurations that continue to occur under the auspices of a now deep-seated anti-terrorist agenda in the U.S. and the imperial era and nationalism that it renews. Brewer's claims and the legislative measures they encouraged functioned so that immigrants, and in time, anyone who might be seen as, a, as an immigrant, were seen, given to be seen, as terrorists or not at all. In the regime of distortion, practices of looking then are constrained by the given to be seen that is itself disciplined by specular logics that are predicated on false and limiting binaries. Specul specular logics operate such that images and imaginings of people can be seen as either eligible for personhood and thereby worthy of social life or ineligi ineligible and so worthy of social death. And I hope that here you, um, there you hear uh, Lisa Cacho. Human value, as Lisa Cacho argues, is, quote, made legible in relation to the deviant, the non-American, the non-normative, the pathologized, and the recalcitrant, the legally repudiated other. Non-images in a regime of distortion come into focus, are made legible, and gain currency through the social imaginary, wherein non-normative others are first conjured, then believed to be, and ultimately seen as terrorizing, and therefore always racialized subjects to be devalued, feared, contained, deported, or otherwise eliminated. Such a developed focus on the non-image is intended as a demonstration of the urgent need for protection for particular, for particular and particularly valued populations in Arizona against the racialized bodies of those not valued. Non-images produced in Arizona's regime of distortion have functioned to constitute powerful rhetorical arguments, visual arguments for new regulatory techniques and biotechnologies of border control. As Wendy Hesford argues, specular logics so often conspire with panoptic logics to structure and limit ways of looking and seeing. This specular disciplining functions, in turn, to produce conceptual closures, and that's important to my argument, that are achieved through 
um, the hardening of ideological support for the expansion of rights for some and the curtailment of rights for others. I'm focused on the ways in a regime of distortion that a non-image is produced and reproduced. To better understand its force and function as a key characteristic of the precarious rhetorics I'm proposing here, I consider what it does, how it gets distributed, and with what consequences. And I've learned that sort of tight frame from uh, Sara Ahmed. I end with a call for new practices of looking that I'm going to propose as a queer visuality of wild refraction. The wild refractions of queer visuality are concepts which I'm only introducing here um, this evening, but for which I'll offer an extended in-progress definition tomorrow that I hope uh, you'll work with me on. Wild refractions refuse the given to be seen and its delimitations and devaluations. They call viewers instead to look and to see differently, to feel differently, to be moved to do differently, especially in contexts where dehumanizing images are consistently conjured and where the deemed human is exclusively worthy. To understand the regime of distortion and the role of the non-image therein, I consider how dominant discourses, especially at times of heightened nationalism, and as espoused by the talking heads and authorities of the state, circulate co-constitutively with images and how together they've come to have particular meaning and consequences. I'm specifically interested here in Brewer's reference to a fiction and how that fiction, in and through the regime of distortion, worked to constitute a someone who didn't exist in the Arizona de desert. To better understand how that fictive subject functioned as a non-image in the social imaginary, um, to become the unstated premise of the argument for increased um, border militarization, the expansion of border controls, and the culpability of the non-normative body. I turn to rhetorical studies. Specifically, in the rhetoric of visual argument, J. Anthony Blair invokes Aristotle to consider how the art of rhetoric and argument continues to be identified with Western conceptualizations of modes of persuasion, including demonstration. Demonstration's instrument, he reminds us, um, is the enthymeme, an argument in which the unstated premise or taken for granted assumption can be and is left out. An enthymeme depends on a particular kind of audience participation that affects its own persuasion as the audience fills in, whether actively or passively, the unexpressed omitted premise according to prevailing norms and affective intensities. And that's also important to the argument here. Um, those prevailing norms and affective intensities that produce and sustain them. In a regime of distortion, the conditions for enthymematic argument are carefully cultivated and curated. The unstated premise of the visual argument constructed through the non-image is a curated distortion that's secured through the active production and cultivation of fears, insecurities, and suspicions. And I started with um, panic as the word that would title the talk, and I changed it and thought it's always awful to do that to people once everything's um, set up and circulating. But I've moved now to suspicion as sort of less, um, more insidious and maybe less spectacular than panic. Um, Anyway, that's where I am now with that title. The fear, suspicion, and insecurity manufactured in a re regime of distortion serves a powerful social and rhetorical function that responds to and creates those heightened nationalisms I've, I've referenced. Non-normative others can be made to appear, or rather can be conjured, as threatening to the safety and well-being of normative citizen subjects and their citizen settings. In the regime of distortion, any subject who's given to be seen as an immigrant and not as a proper citizen is rendered vulnerable, and in their vulnerability, devalued and marked for slow um, and social and or social death. The non-image functions then as a given to be seen that must be taken for granted. The given to be seen is a conjured image or non-image of the always racialized, non-existent immigrant of beheading terrorist in Arizona. Such conjure, uh, conjurings operate by sedimenting insecurity and securing the norms of neoliberal governmentality, including what Kim Rigal uh, refers to as the, quote, biopolitics of citizenship, or those governing practices that establish the valuation of those seen and deemed worthy as responsible individuals and the devaluation of others as worthy of detainment and deportation. And there I'm thinking uh, specifically of Arizona. This racialized differentiation of valuation is what Judith Butler is addressing when discussing the geopolitical distribution of corporeal vulnerability, a radically inequitable distribution in the service of a sense of safety um, for those valued in that 9-11 project that I introduced early. 
It's what Yen Le Espiritu, ethnic studies professor, is referring to, to in her discussions of differential inclusion, and what Lisa Cacho is referring to when she considers how, quote, the interconnected processes of valor, uh, valorization, devaluation, and revaluation, i.e. race, gender, sexuality, class, nation, legality, etc., work interdependently to reify value and relations of um, inequality as normative, natural, and obvious. In a regime of distortion, informed by an anti-terrorist agenda, nativism takes root, and culprits are produced as increased measures of protection, means of containment or exp expulsion, and precarious conditions. In the regime of distortion, the non-image -im of the immigrant as beheading terrorist, referenced multiple times by Brewer, can be imagined, comprehended, and ultimately seen as a terrorist whose image argues for is evidence of that need for always greater security that results in precarious vulnerabilities for devalued others. In other words, it is a function of precarity but also produces precarious conditions and contexts. The enthymeme or present left out, premise left out of the um, argument for increased measures of border securitization is the non-image of the non-existent immigrant as beheading terrorist in Arizona. In the on-the-record um, interview, Van Susten and Brewer were broadcast live from southern Arizona with saguaros, the Sonoran Desert's indicator species, as their dramatic backdrop in the desert expanse. The desert represents territory taken over by the U.S. The fact of territory secured through conquest is tied to the anxieties that are implied by this isolated desert Sonoran scape landscape in which these two women appear alone together. Brewer's interview with Van Susteren implied the need for protection of U.S. citizenry, and specifically of white women, threatened by the specter of a racialized immigrant terrorist um, on the loose and in the seeming to be increasingly danger, dangerous Arizona desert, and suddenly vulnerable U.S. territory. Here again is an unstated premise in the argument of the need for greater securitization of these contested spaces of settler colonialism, what I'm calling the imagined as rightful citizen settings, and for protection of the citizen subject who then rightfully belongs therein. It's implied that these women, who uh, appear to belong as the proper and legitimate reproducers of the nation and its values, and this land, this citizen setting, which is the birthright, of course, of the proper and legitimate citizen subject, need protection from the terrorizing immigrants who continue to threaten the terrain and its inhabitants and who must be deterred, contained, deported, or made to encounter death-inducing um, conditions in a terrain that's purposefully cultivated to be isolated, inhospitable, and uninhabitable. And here, I just wonder, maybe let me see if we have the, we might not have audio. We didn't check. Yeah, sorry about that. If it takes me too long, I can play it. Do you want to try? Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sure. Okay. Well, you're going to see the visual then. <laughs> um, it's there that she references the beheadings mm -hmm. and the juxtaposition of the, the collective and the individual are important to what I'm trying to get you to think about. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to um, send Patrick the clip later so that you can hear it or Ben, one of them will have it. All right, so this broadcast interview scene alternates between desert framed images of Governor Brewer and a compressed box zooming on and off the screen with, screen with B roll footage of protesters, predominantly Latinos, marching in the streets. 
Brewer's claim of the immigrant as beheading terrorist and immigrant as would-be invader work through the regime of distortion to secure images of the good and needing protection citizen subject, as well as to introduce the non-image of a menacing immigrant terrorist together with a racialized collective to cultivate and curate nat nativist sentiments, suspicions, and fear, and then to justify efforts to push out, contain, detain, or deport those who must be feared. The disciplining and delimiting effects of this cultivation of fear for practices of looking um, for anyone <clears throat> who is believed to be, can be seen as immigrant, are central to Nikolaus Mirzov's discussion of the racialized divide that's um, instantiated any time a, quote, citizen looks like a person suspected of being a migrant. As Susana Losa argues, the cultural production of the alien other, in this case of the mythical and monstrous immigrant as beheading terrorist, reveals national anxieties about invasion and conquest. Tracing the productions of these non-images in Arizona's regime of distortion illuminates their connection to settler colonialism, through which monstrous fictions and racialized fears have historically been manufactured and sustained. It is undergirded by logics of seeing and believing that function as systems of valuation. Non-images circulate in this regime as extensions of colonial racial formations that rely on colorized hierarchies to organize and divide um, life and death. <clears throat> Brewer's false claims function then to produce the conditions for believing and seeing. The non-image non emerges as powerfully persuasive. It serves to water the seeds for an already established, if still emerging, xenophobic climate and a regressive legislative agenda that counted on perpetually manufactured nativism as fear of non-normative others, um, of always only monstrous uh, possibilities. The rhetorical trope of immigrant as beheading terrorists functioned in our regime of distortion to invoke distorted images with staying power that could stick, but they could also be rather easily supplanted and therefore updated as needed. The non-image dependent on fear-inflected assumptions reveals itself as a potent and nimble argument that can be made and remade again and again. The production of the non-image is secured and sustained within the regime of distortion through fear implied and induced by authorized voices and visions, as well as through legislative measures and media productions. The repeated circulation of Brewer's false claims made from this Arizona desert scape operated through the regime of distortion to produce place-based fear grounded in disinformation that in turn informed the production, the manifestation and circulation of a non-image that you'll see continues to grow in our state. With each new fiction as updated rhetorical trope, from alien to illegal to terrorist and onto territorial invader, monsters were reassembled and reimagined. Non-images quickly reveal themselves as easily to supplant with new fictive imaginaries as visuals, whose accumulations grow more monstrous over time and with each new, newly produ produced pardon me, assemblage. Rhetorical shifts work through updated tropes to effectively introduce a constellation of newly assembled culprits and uh, first to imagine, to believe in, to see, and to fear. The distortions reached beyond um, subjects to space as well. The Arizona was, at the time of Brewer's false claim, increasingly deadly terrain. It's true. But not for the citizen subject of Brewer's expressed concern. Rather, and especially as vulnerabilities were being redistributed, it was increasingly precarious for crossing migrants who through various borderlands policies were being herded to and through the most isolated, uninhabitable, and dangerous terrain of the Sonoran Desert. According to Coalición de Derechos Humanos, a grassroots migrant organization, for the 2009-10 reporting period, the Pima County Medical Examiner's Office reported one of the highest numbers of migrant deaths resulting for those attempting to cross this uh, desert's death corridor, 253. And you can find those statistics on Coalición de Derechos Humanos' website. Brewer's interview um, in the desert depicts an expanse of stark beauty where Brewer sits with wind blowing through her hair. The focus is on the desert scape as home territory rather than as death-inducing ter terrain, a place not routinely seen by non-immigrants, and so in some ways a nowhere in, in the dominant social imaginary. 
um, but uh, somewhere for crossing immigrants who routinely die in their efforts to cross and whose deaths are increasingly probable due to this redistribution of precarious conditions. In other words, the non-image has affects and effects on subjects and spaces. And here, Judith Butler's question comes to mind, quote, if someone is lost and that person is not a someone, then what and where is the loss? In a regime of distortion, the loss of a not someone cannot be perceived and is therefore not seen as a loss, especially because it happens in a veritable nowhere, a place that is clearly not a citizen setting, one where precarious conditions are not of interest because they're of no consequence to the citizen subject. The precarity at work here is such that an immigrant subject can be seen and located as circulating terrorist or they won't be seen at all. It's worth noting here that Brewer's claim of immigrant as beheading terrorists were proven in time to be altogether untrue. Neither the Border Patrol, nor migrant rights organizations, nor local law enforcement officials have ever confirmed or been able to confirm that Im immigrants crossing the desert in Arizona have ever beheaded anyone. However, truth was never really the point. Um, as in a regime of deportation, and here I'm calling on uh, Nicolas de Genova's work, the fear manufactured in a regime of distortion is what is most urgent to the force and function of its productions and possibilities. Fear has a particular function then in the regime of distortion, as does suspicion. It serves in this instance to shift the fo focal point away from the inhumane and dehumanizing, increasingly precarious conditions of the Sonoran Desert for crossing migrants and of the reality of their deaths there and onto a state manufactured fiction. Migrant de deaths are frequent in the desert, but Brewer's claims actively and effectively displace the focus from what could have been on real people dying in treacherous terrain to a focus on the threat being constructed through appeals to visions of immigrant terrorists, um, terrorist others, already established in the national imaginary and being secured in the state imaginary. Brewer's presence in the desert serves as a claim of belonging for those seemingly rational citizen subjects of a neoliberal state juxtaposed with relatively irrational, angry collectives of menacing brown bodies, indistinguishable in the neoliberal imaginary as individuals. So the production of the non-image, first as the assembled fictive trope of the immigrant as beheading terrorist in the Sonoran Desert, and then as the territorial invader, um, and then through related distortions to other monstrous fictions, circulated throughout the regressive legislative landscape of the 49th legislature of the state of Arizona. As Butler notes, it is at those times when a nation and its borders are remembered and recognized as more porous and permeable than what were previously imagined, something implied in the Van Susteren and Brewer um, desert interview, that a radical desire for security, often accompanied by a racialized hysteria, ensues. At such dispersals of fear, Butler argues, everyone is, quote, free to imagine and identify the source of terror. I'm just going to serve a little more water. <laughs> So after Brewer's false claims, conservative Arizona lawmakers made monsters of not only immigrants, but of any and all who could be imagined, quote, as reasonably suspicious, including Latinos, LGBTQ individuals, pregnant women of color, students of color, and teachers of color. The fear-inflected social imaginary is fueled in the regime of distortion by the continual reproduction and production and reproduction of reassembled non-images. Each new monster can be uh, produced from the reassembled remains um, of previous monsters. And I hope there you're thinking of Frankenstein. The power of the non-image as precarious rhetoric is in its ability to substitute one terrorizing monster for another and thereby to produce a given to be seen that functions as part of a system of redistrib uh, redistributed vulnerabilities and differentiated valuations. Gacho's concept of transparent recognition is at work in the placement of the immigrant body into the fiction of the beheading immigrant and then into all of the fictive productions that followed. Such productive practices in the regime of distortion are reminiscent for me of Sara Ahmed's figure in the present, quote, who gives us nightmares about the future as an anticipation of a future injury, despite being evidence that's actually not evidence. So here I turn to the legislative notion of the reasonably suspicious. SB 1070 
Arizona's now infamous immigration law has come to be known as among the most strident anti-immigration um, and anti-immigrant bills in the U.S. It introduced and stabilized the notion of, quote, the reasonably suspicious as common knowledge, as common sense. The reasonably suspicious clause in SB 1070 produced that flexible non-image that function through the construction of any and all reasonably suspicious others as an unstated premise in the argument of, for fear and suspicion of others and for increased border military, militarization as well as other state restrictions. Since SB 1070, legislative proposals have been produced, pardon me, legislative pr proposals have produced a constellation of terrorist types, expanding out from the immigrant as beheading terrorists to mothers of color, insidiously producing babies of color as weapons. That's the anchor baby legislation that was proposed. The revolutionary racist intellectual invader, that's HB 2281, which banned ethnic studies in our state. The deviant transgender person, that is SB 1045, the bathroom bill that was produced. And the destroyer of family values, that's SB 1188, the adoption preference bill um, that wanted to disallow LGBTQ people from adopting. So, or did that. Non-images of immigrant terrorists then were recycled, reassembled, and recirculated as monstrous others. As Ahmed suggests, the more signs circulate, the more affective they become. In becoming more affective, their stickiness is revealed as related to resemblance. It sticks to any and all that re resemble those monsters represented in and by the non-image. In other words, and in Arizona, it's the reasonably suspicious, imagined and seen as non-white, brown and black bodies, brown and black knowledges, queer, and all non-normative others that emerge through this collection of legislative me measures as others to be commonsensically feared and thereby contained, deported, or eliminated. Boxed up in the case of ethnic studies. The reasonably suspicious were racialized, pathologized, and criminalized to effectively separate the normative from the non-normative and thereby the citizen from the terrorist. As the non-images proliferate, the reasonably suspicious circulate in expanding conditions of precarity. Of course, migrants have long circulated as suspicious others, and as monsters begin with the always already monstrously named alien. Through the regime of distortion, the alien morphed into this post-9-11 context um, into a constellation of legislated culprits that <coughs> circulated as threatening and terrorizing non-images in the social imaginary. Brewer's assertion of immigrants as beheading terrorists and of headless bodies in the Arizona desert were part of her concerted effort operating through the regime of distortion to justify then new practices of surveillance, biopolitics, and increased border militarization to reassert the state's claim to land, to support an ethno-normative and singular version of history, and to curtail the rights of any body or body of knowledge imagined and reassembled as a terrorizing threat to the state. Brewer's false assertions move the public to see and believe that Arizona citizens were living in a time of intense crisis and justified fear as well as a concentrated and growing border violence. Her false assertions and the legislative measures that they inspired moved the, produ the public to productively see um, th that these violences were instigated by immigrants who should only be understood as always, already, and always only a threat. These legislative efforts and the practices they put in place suggested a relational fecundity of terrorizing bodies, creating the ever-increasing and apparent need for containment and deportation, as well as for securing um, the precarious conditions for the monstrous others. I hope I've made that case. <laughs> I want to talk just for a moment about this legislative context, which is uh, uh, occurred slightly after I moved to Arizona. It can be understood as one in which um, subjects are slowly worn down through what G Gabriel Jack Chin has referred to as attrition through enforcement, which creates the conditions for self-deportation for those populations threatened by the monstrous rhetorical productions of the state and the media. As a practice within the regime of distortion, attrition through enforcement renders migrants both hyper-visible and invisible, and so deeply distorted and uh, effectively dehumanized. The regime of distortion cultivates, there I just want to pause for a moment, what I think the effects of that are to produce um, even divisions within the migrant community. So the better migrant leaves, right? Um, and anyone who stays 
um, then becomes um, uh, responsible for their own sort of persecution um, mm. in, that, in, in that illogic. So the regime of distortion cultivates ever more treacherous conditions through pre precarious rhetorics for the already as well as for the newly made vulnerable populations. The reassembled, um, de uh, dehumanizing non-image of the immigrant as beheading te uh, terrorist morphed right in our imaginations into an alien invader and over time through among the most strident anti-immigrant legislation in the US into anyone who was seen or who could be imagined as reasonably suspicious then. Again, the non-white, the brown and black body that's always already reasonably suspicious and monstrous and therefore highly surveilled at this time which occurred simultaneously with the legislated extension of the reach of police officers and everyday citizens as deputized immigrant officials, rendering the circulation of those able to be seen as reasonably suspicious ever more vulnerable. The original legislation called on everyday citizen and police officers to, uh, they were actually deputized by that legislation um, to uh, hail the reasonably suspicious. So this regime of distortion functions in and as the public sphere, which as Butler notes is constituted, quote, in part by what can appear, and the regulation of the sphere of appearance is one way to establish what will count as reality and what will not. These are the conjuring powers of the precarious rhetorics I've sketched here this evening as emerging in Arizona through what I've proposed as a regime of distortion. Then Governor Brewer, the legislature, and the media together regulated what could appear and disappear with repercussions for what could and should be seen, and I argued felt, even imagined. Their collective efforts populated the reservoir of social imaginaries with inter interchangeable terrorists to be imagined and feared. Such regulating productions also have ramica ramifications, of course, for practices of looking. Images have long functioned as normative forces of, quote, American nationalisms, cosmopolitanisms, and neoliberal global politics, and that's Wendy Hesford. They function to criminalize and pathologize, and as such have fueled and been fueled by state-manufactured rhetorics of fear, insecurity, and suspicion. In a regime of distortion, the state's rhetorical claims needn't be true for the productive force of their distortions to stick and to circulate as justifications for the expansion of state power and the curtailment of rights. The non-image that corresponds to Brewer's claim of a beheading immigrant in the desert became instantly legible as a roaming and raving terrorist in the social imaginary. Even if Brewer had wanted to debunk her deception, its fear-inflected circulation had already served its productive and powerful rhetorical function. The named citizenry of Arizona, those worthy of protection for social life, were being asked to see and to guard against unsubstantiated threats con um, constructed through the argument of the non-image. It was taken up and circulated in the social imaginary that's been primed since 9-11 and really before in the US, but I think that moment is crucial. For instantaneous comprehension, knowing and seeing the menacing image of a terrorist around every corner. The move from one imagined terrorist to another was really rather seamless in Arizona. All are legible as threatening and monstrous. Seeing them as such appears in the regime of distortion to be necessary ocular practices of the good citizen subject. So underpinning my ideas here regarding the non-image is a necessary reversal of the axiom from seeing is believing to believing is seeing. Mm -hmm. I've worked instead from that understanding that looking is always rhetorically mediated and from the understanding too that fear and suspicion are sedimented in the visual, the sonic, the discursive, affective, legislative landscape and borderlands context in the state of um, Arizona with implications for what is believed and therefore what is seen. Such a context allows for that facile substitution I've, I've suggested to you of one terrorist for another. In other words, the precarious rhetorics of, of this regime can always easily produce new terrorists that can be assembled as new cultural anxieties are manufactured and made mi visually manifest and here, um, I love it if you were thinking about Donald Trump. Um, I, he's not in my paper, but he could be. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we can talk about that maybe. Examining claims then that emerge in a regime of distortion can offer insight into the relationship between media and social imaginaries and how the non-image functions, circulates and proliferates through political discourse and legislation and as affective and effective argument for the slew of ultra-conservative, xenophobic, regressive legislation that was proposed and or passed in Arizona. The non-image can be imagined and reassembled, as I hope I've shown, as the monstrous face of any brown or black
black, queer, student, teacher, immigrant, trans, non-normative other in Arizona. The non-image circulated through the regime of distortion to effectively alter the focus and ways of looking in the desert so that the given to be seen was the threat of a fictive beheading immigrant in the desert rather than the reality of migrant deaths there. Sources of terror have proliferated under Governor Brewer and through the media. As Gacho argues, media provide us the tools that enable us to see and simul simultaneously deny what we're seeing. In other words, the non-image of the fictional terrorists introduced in Arizona are what become recognizable as uh, terrorist terrorizing images that circulate to sediment um, the panic and the suspicion, distribute vulnerability and thereby justify differential valuations and heighten measures of securitization. It is again, as Cacho's, uh, it is again Cacho's transparent recognition that's at work in the production of the non-image that also affects the replacement of the immigrant body into a fiction of the beheading immigrant. Cacho carefully distinguishes transparent recognition from misrecognition, and I think it's important to, to say that. In so doing, she offers a helpful way to understand how people can come to be seen as a monster or as a fictional figure that people have made real and consequential, which can in turn provide justification for social abandonment, the suspension of civil liberties, and the enacted state, uh, and enacted state uh, sanctioned violences. Hegemonic viewpoints assume the idea that all that needs to be seen can be seen and in the same way. Mainstream media, the particular voices and visual, visions that circulate therein, have a dual function in, um, as Gacho reminds us, they enable us to both see and simultaneously deny what we're seeing, and in this context of a fear-inflected carceral state and militarized border, this means always only seeing immigrants as criminals and would-be terrorists. It also means not seeing the desert terrain as made increasingly precarious for immigrants and all non-normative others. New practices of looking and seeing must be taken into consideration um, rather must take into consideration the force and function of a hegemonic viewpoint and um, normative perception. So my aim this evening has been to demonstrate the process and productive power of precarious rhetorics in the regime of distortion and the specular logics that structure looking practices therein. It is there that the imagined becomes an image or rather a non-image. It circulates as a given to be seen that in turn functions as an affective and effective argument for the entrenchment of normative perspectives and perceptions and as forces for new technologies of securitization and reinforced regulatory techniques. The non-images of these precarious rhetorics also provide a visualized sense of what and who must be feared, contained, deported, and otherwise disappeared. Such non-images are dependent on, conditioned, and particular ways, <clears throat> pardon me, of looking and seeing. I began from the understanding that the war on terrorism was carried out in Arizona, first on the always already monstrous, mythical, and fictional illegal alien who morphed into the beheading terrorist and has ex insidiously extended to all non-normative others and their uh, other bodies and their knowledges. The material consequences of these expanded distortions for non-normative <coughs> subjects is seen in increased uh, policing and police brutality, border brutality, surveillance, escalated criminalization, and ongoing pathologizations. Assemblages are shifting in the effective <coughs> and visual economies of Arizona and throughout the U.S., as we, as we all know, with implications for the promotion and production of life and of bare life in a regime of distortion wherein humans are differentially valued and distorted to resemble or be reassembled as monsters. In focusing on dominant and dominating discourses and their role in the production of the non-images with implications for practices and politics of looking, I'm working to understand how a claim that never could be substantiated, should, substantiated could be made with such rhetorical force. The non-image that Brewer produced served as that visual argument dependent on the post-9-11 national imaginary. As Hesford notes, audiences draw on a host of historical associations, cultural narratives, structures of feelings and belief, and rhetorical expectations in their engagements with images and texts and their context. Norms operate not only by producing ideals, but importantly, um, as Butler notes, images of the less than human in the guise of the human to show how the less than human disguises itself and threatens to deceive. That threat to deception is really important, I think, in the regime of distortion. Here, then, is the rhetorical power, the force and function of precarious rhetorics, the non-image. It could be made to be anyone. 
of unbelonging in the state, according to normative and nationalist revisions, sedimented fears and suspicions, assembled fictions and neo-colonizing imaginaries. The visuality implied by such an imaginary serves a stabilizing if contingent function in that the non-image upon which it's predicated can rather easily be supplanted as the context dictates. Um, as Butler notes, normative schemes work through providing no image, um, no name, no narrative, so that there never was a life. And if there was a life, it gets devalues, devalued, distorted, invisibilized, de dehumanized um, in and through the regime of distortion. Prevailing power structures and relations are predicated on such radical distortions and the shifting assemblages that they imply and impose and secure. Such distortions were initiated and accomplished in Arizona through the authorized and authoritative references to the fictional beheading immigrant. I'm following the production of such distortions in search of new ways of looking and seeing that might practice a politics of refusal, a refusing of the given to be seen, um, of such authorized and fear-inflected distortions that produce conditions of vulnerability, precarity, and death. For tomorrow's talk, I'm going to introduce a project where I actually attempt to practice new ways of looking that are informed by transnational women of color, third space, and indigenous feminisms, and the queer world-making possibilities their insights can inspire. Thank you so much for your attention. I know that was long. So we have plenty of time for, for questions, so I'm going to open it up to... Um, the floor for questions. Okay, and now I'll I can get my glasses back better. on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. This was fascinating. I am interested in um, how flexible you intend the concept of the non-image to be. For you, is it critical, for example, that the state be the rator that is constructing this non-image? Or... Uh, do you mean for the conception of the non-image to extend to a sort of broader description of um, any time the image intentionally or unintentionally doesn't exist to communicate informatically? That's a, a really a wonderful question. And I, I, immediately as you started speaking, I thought of Amy Goodman and her question to us about whether or not there's a difference between uh, the media concentrated in the hands of so few and state-run media. So here I would say, no, it doesn't have to be the state, but it always kind of is um, uh, when we have th those kinds of concentrated power interests. But no, I don't. I think it has to be um, voices of authority, voices that... And so I, I wouldn't be able to name them because I think those emerge sometimes are contextual. Um, and with with uh, the power to to be engaged in the reproduction, redistribution rather, of vulnerability in a community. And I don't always know who those are, but I would suggest they're probably related or have relationships to the state. Um, but, so I don't know, is my real answer. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I haven't imagined that there could only be one source. In fact, that's, that's the, um, that's why I think it's so urgent. Um, it, it sounds like the regime of distortion is really, really central to how you're thinking about the non-image, that, that we couldn't, at least in your conception, separate those things. Ah, I see what you're asking. So I do think the regime of distortion is urgent to the project of the non-image, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think a university could be a regime of distortion. Um, I think... I think there are lots of regimes of distortion, and maybe it's about scale and context, and uh, and that therefore contingent mm -hmm. in that way. Is that is that good? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, interesting talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question about some of the uh, some of your terminology, some of your your concept building, uh, particularly you know the regime of distortion. And, uh, and as, as I was listening to you, and I was, I was wondering if, if this idea, you know, really isn't just another word for racism. Uh, and, um, and the way that you, that you utilize this concept uh, uh, is, is very reminiscent of something that we've actually talked about in, in my class, you know, my students are here. Okay. Uh, we finished okay. reading a book uh, uh, called, uh, uh, called Forgotten Death. And it was about the lynching of Mexicans, uh, you know, in an 80-year period after sure. the U.S.-Mexico War, uh, and um, 
uh, a regime of distortion uh, existed at that time. Uh, you know, Mexicans are dangerous, they're criminals, uh, they're, they're violent, they're undeserving of the land, uh, uh, they're not putting it to productive use. Uh, and, um, and, you know, this, this, to me, in my mind, could have been just easily uh, uh, reduced to racism. We talked about, you know, where did it come from? Why is it necessary? Well, you know, it's a justification for manifest destiny. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, everything that you talked about, and, and this kind of clicked when you said, well, you know, believe in a scene. Uh, uh, you know, racist concepts really don't need empirical verification. They're, they're, they're concepts, they're notions attributed uh, to the other and used as justification for, for treating them badly, taking their, taking their possessions. So I wonder if, if, uh, if maybe, if maybe that's, that's not really what you're talking about. And perhaps it assumes a, uh, a, greater, uh, a, a greater pain and dynamic in our minds because we're living through its manifestation right now. But if we lived in South Texas or California or New Mexico, in 1848, I mean, it certainly seemed <laughs> far more powerful when, when groups of thugs were out killing us uh, and driving our cattle away and, and take, taking, our, taking our property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it's about racism, without a doubt, and racialization, but it, it is, I am attempting a, a more intersectional um, uh, uh, concept so that we can understand how in Arizona we could move so seamlessly between the beheading migrant terrorist, the fiction of that, the, of that subject, to uh, the transgender body and the fear of the trans person entering bathrooms. They actually proposed a, a papers, uh, a similar papers legislation. And to understand that relationship, I think we can't rely on race and racism and racialization alone. And so I'm very inspired, and that's why I turn back to uh, feminism and women of color feminism by intersectional approaches that ask us to be attentive to sex and gender and anatomy increasingly with the trans sort of um, uh, ethos, the, the, the uh, disarticulation of the body from sex and gender so that we have a, a, more, um, a more dimensional sort of uh, understanding of how people are, are made into culprits. And yes, racialization is at play, but not singularly. Helpful? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you for this talk. It was really great. I have a few questions. Uh, I'm wondering, as I was listening, I was wondering how unique this analysis is to Arizona. So as you think about, as you think about the application beyond Arizona, like mm -hmm. it, is it that this is, a, this is really like an Arizona phenomenon? Because it really felt tied to Arizona. Yeah. So I'm wondering about that, maybe mm -hmm. first of all. Okay, so this is um, sad to, to admit, but I've been writing this paper for a long time. <laughs> and uh, I just finally had to stop. But I was so horrified to live through the 49th legislature that that's what gave birth to this paper. And um, I felt like I needed to speak from the place I was living. I'm really inspired by uh, Goldswig's concept of critical localism that calls us, and those of you who I know are on the job market, I think this is a wonderful concept to, to take with you. It calls us to know the place we enter well, mm -hmm. to get to know it well, to know its histories and its peoples and the, the people's contributions, um, knowledge contributions. And so I, I really started studying Arizona. So it starts there. Um, in this paper, but no, mm -hmm. as we can see. I mean, I do think it has uh, applicability uh, around the world, frankly, because we're seeing so many displacements and productions of diasporic communities where I think this is, this is relevant. Um, but it's what I know best, mm -hmm. and it's what I studied and prepared for this paper, but no, I, I don't mm -hmm. mean it to, to be um, so insular. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I was also wondering, so I was really compelled by the morphing, how, how subjects, I think you said something like, subjects morph into each other. And I'm wondering if that, if this only happens through fear appeals, if, if, because so much of the morphing kind of, kind of organizes around, oh, be fearful of that group, be fearful of that group, right. be fearful of that group. So is... Fear, suspicion, is this an animating force for the morphing, or are there other... I don't know what I'm trying to get no, at, but I'm, I'm just wondering about... I'm thinking of Ben's of, question yeah. in some way, and that they come together really beautifully. 
Um, no, I don't think it's, it is an animating force, but it's not the only animating force, because I'm thinking to the, the students that we met with earlier in the mm -hmm. politics of respectability, and the ways in which particular morphings produce, for example, that, um, I'm thinking of the Time article, the Time uh, magazine article that predicted that, you know, people would look more brownish mm -hmm. over time, and that morphing that wasn't, it may not, you know, I don't know what the intentions were altogether. It may not have been to produce suspicion and fear, though I think that's one of the effects of that morphing. But I think the morphing could be taken up normatively um, and still have multiple uh, consequences. But I have to keep thinking. <laughs> Thank you. My answer for now. Yes? Um, I, I'm really interested in this, the reversal of the suspicious publics rooted in ocular practices. So I'm wondering, how do those of us who are interested in affect proceed when we want to try to, to sort of validate visceral feelings as evidence of something, mm -hmm. to now facing arguments that are really <coughs> beliefs that are sort of unwarranted or, or unjustified? Okay, I, I was I got caught up in the first part. Can you just say that one more time? And let me get my pencil because I yeah. don't want here. Okay, ready. Okay, so if, if affect was you know affect studies was once a way to sort of validate um, visceral visceral feelings or feelings in general, now we're facing arguments that are, are rooted in beliefs or feelings that are unjustified, and so there are attempts to say, well, um, how do you know that's true? Well, I, I believe it. I feel it. Mm -hmm. I believe that that person mm -hmm. is untrustworthy or. Are, Troublesome or whatever, and so it's mm. like it's an affective argument that's unjustified, right? And so I don't know how we perceive when affect became a way to say, "Wow, look at what's really going on here." These are affective. Problems. I love this oh, question, yeah. and I don't have a great answer except I'll say, um, just yesterday in on NPR. Um, Though my brother would argue uh, that he, he's a professor who reclaims indigenous knowledge for the sciences, and he said, you know, there. Are so many senses. We don't have just five senses. But now they've de decided there's a sixth sense and it's intuition. And so I love that question. It's very timely for that reason. But I think that it, it, we didn't... Why I'm turning to multiplicity as one of the answers, this uh, uh, wild refraction of multiplicity, is because I think sometimes when, um, when we make a move to understand better, we sometimes unwittingly reproduce the binary. And so to think that feelings should be more valuable than all of the other things um, would be the mistake there. So that would be the trouble, is to reproduce that in, in a hierarchy that also needs to be troubled. So that we're putting into play thinking, feeling, acting, knowing, hearing. Um, and Laura Marx, who I'll call on tomorrow, asks us you know, to even take the olfactory and the gustatory, and so it's about tasting and you know, all of the ways in which fear is reproduced in our body, where desire, pleasure, joy, all of that. So it, it's more complicated, but I still think you're onto something, and I'd love to get your email and be in touch. <laughs> because I, I think I need to still grapple with that in tomorrow's presentation. I will be trying to do that. Um, but it's a great question, and I, I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to include the affective as urgent sure. to the project, but never as singular or most important either. Mm -hmm. yeah. So might you then be talking about having a kind of affective refraction as a possibility? Yeah. Absolutely, because I think tomorrow one of the things I'll look at is like beauty and the grotesque, you know, and that's there's an affective refraction there, mm -hmm. you know, compelled and uh, um, also not refused. There's another word I'm thinking of that won't come out, but you know, those dueling and then something more, maybe something we can't name. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, absolutely. A, a question that I had as Stephanie was speaking was. Um, you, you use the term non-looking in your talk as well. And, uh, and I got to thinking, a non-image is also a non-looking. And I kind of wonder then what you see as the responsibility of the viewer or of mm -hmm. the audience mm -hmm. in the face of yeah. the non-image. Right. I think we just have to know more complicatedly. 
I think we live in a world where that's, that's what we should be teaching. That's how we, I mean, that's how students come to us already. Um, but it's how to, how to be critically engaged with those uh, multiple ways of knowing. But also, uh, a politics of refusal would refuse the ocular as the, as the primary. Right? Not just the singular, but it's also trying to scramble things so that we don't reproduce the hierarchy that we've relied on for so long that has a lot to do with colonization and ownership and privatization, um, you know, what we can see and, and take hold of. But so it, it's, a, it's a scrambling of that, of that hierarchy. I want to call it, in a way, a remix of sorts. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ben. I wonder if I could ask another concept-related sure. question. Uh, and uh, you know, please forgive my, my vulgar appearances. I'm a, I'm a social scientist. That's um, quite all right. I, I was intrigued by your, your notion of, uh, of social death. Um, and, um, and, and I was wondering, too, if, if, the, if that idea of social death is just not uh, another word for the exercise of power. And that is how one group determines the rules of inclusion and exclusion. Uh, you know, who's in, who's out, who's legitimate, who's not, who's, who's civilized, uh, who's not. Uh, and, I, uh, and I thought of it uh, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, you know, this electoral year, as Arizona, you know, your own state, is, is actually starting to turn purple. Uh, Wouldn't that and, be nice? And it, and it would seem to me that, that, and that in a purple state, to use your imagery, uh, that, uh, that Latinos are going to be raised from uh, social death to, to social illness. They'll just be sick, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and perhaps in the future they'll get well. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I don't know of any Latino organization or group that says, well, uh, we've got to turn the tables on white people, uh, but rather there should be greater inclusion and integration. And if that's true, the entire body politic would uh, experience a new degree of health. So, so it just seems to me that, that we're talking about power here. Uh, and, uh, and, and when one group can tell the other that you're out, uh, they're, they're exercising that power, and, and, that's, and, and that's changing. It, it just, you know, I, I, uh, you know maybe, maybe there are just simpler, more direct terms for, for describing what, you, yeah. what you're observing. Yeah, and I, I'm sorry if I, if I appeared to take the credit for that term. That's Lisa Cacho's term from her book that I find really compelling and beautiful. But you've said it so well, I think, yes, what you say. Yes, mm -hmm. it is about power and redistribution, and that's what she's getting at. But I think she's also mm. calling us... Mm. Go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. No, go. Well, I mean, I think what that text is getting at is the, the valuing that's happening when Latinos are just illness, like the illness or fragile, she's really drawing out social death as oppositionality. Like it, need, it needs the, it needs the, the value needs this opposition. Right, and I think too, um, it's, a, it's a distinction that asks us to imagine, and that's why it's not conceptually precise in some ways, liminality. A liminal space uh, where people are sort of neither nor, not fully participating, not fully incorporated, not fully inclusive, and that and that that space can can erode uh, the presence over time. So maybe it's sort of a poetic way of of getting at what your empirical uh, precision there really their complements to one another as you speak. That's what I hear is a compliment to her concept, not not a. Not exactly a distinction, but an, another way of knowing, I guess, and of trying to to, to account for uh, people for whom power over has have pl been placed into different marginalities with different consequences. Thank you. Anything else? Can we thank our guest once again? For